Rogues have one of the easiest character creation screens, probably alongside Barbarians, because we don't have to make any choices in the class tab here. Basically, every other class has to choose like a fighting style or their subclass or some spells or something, but Rogues, we don't get anything to choose. But what do we get? We have Dexterity and Intelligence saving throw proficiency. Dexterity will help you avoid damage from certain spells, that's our often area of effect spells, and from falling prone for some things like Grease. We get Light Armor proficiency, Simple Weapon proficiency, and then we get a few other weapon proficiencies which are really, really useful as a rogue. So hand crossbow, longsword, not so much, rapier and short sword. And we get the sneak attack action. I will talk about sneak attacks after the character creation screen. But the main thing to know right now is that this is your main source of damage. This plus 1d6 goes up every two levels. So at level 3 it becomes 2d6 and at level 5 it becomes 3d6 and so on. That will keep on going all the way up until the maximum level, whatever that may or may not be. And we can use it either as a melee attack or a ranged attack. Let's go to the race. So any race that gives plus dexterity is probably going to be a race you want to pick. Now you can create rogues using strength. But you miss out on having a good armor class for the most part, unless you take certain feats, but I'll get to that. I think most people would agree, most rogues will have a high dexterity. So we're going to look at races that give a high dexterity. So high elves, in fact elves, dexterity plus two, perfect. Intelligence plus one goes well for one particular subclass. And we get a cantrip. I would usually suggest if you get four rogues in particular, when you're going for a cantrip, I would avoid attacking spells, attacking cantrips in particular, because your sneak attack scales with your level much better than your cantrip damage does. So maybe one of the more utility type cantrips is a good choice, depending on your situation. Perhaps you've got people in your party who need light, so maybe dancing lights or light itself. Minor Illusion goes very well on kind of the theme of rogues trying to like sneak around. Mage Hand can be okay, maybe Blade Ward or Friends, up to you. I'd probably go with Minor Illusion. For Wood Elves, we get a higher movement speed, which is essential for pretty much every character. I say this every time. It's really useful for rogues because they can get more dashes in a turn, so they can go even further, kind of stacking up movement speed. And we get one extra proficiency. And you can see here on the left, rogues get loads of proficiencies, sometimes referred to as skill monkeys. So basically, uh, elves make a good choice, as do drow, because we've got dexterity plus two. Sadly for drow, the weapon proficiencies are weapons we've all, we're already proficient with. These exact weapons come up. We don't get any extra ones, a bit sad, but we do get superior Dark Vision and some spells, which can can be useful, especially Fairy, fairy Fire, because I can give you advantage. We'll get to why that's useful later. Humans, I would usually avoid humans for rogues, because rogues, honestly, when we get to ability points, we're mostly looking at pumping up dexterity as high as possible, and then whatever you want after that. Yeah, Yankee, no. Dwarves, not really. Unless you're trying to make a strength rogue, or you want some medium armor proficiency, then maybe you want to go for either of these two. Half elves can be basically any class. So we go for dexterity and then whatever stat you want with the added bonuses of whatever elf separates you pick. So we've already been through these different types of elves. Halflings make for good rogues as well. The Lightfoot Halfling, we have proficiency in stealth checks, which adds an extra proficiency on the left. We get lucky, which doesn't seem to always work when we have skill checks, but I have seen it work in attack rolls. Lucky means when you roll a 1 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you re-roll the die, basically giving you a second chance. We have advantage on saving throws against being frightened, which can be useful. There are some spells and things that cause frightened, but not too often for us. But we get this lovely dexterity plus 2. Or, if you want to be a bit more hardy, hardy, I say hardy there, a bit more hardy, you go for the strong fit halfling, so you get advantage on saving throws against poison, and resistance to poison damage, and a bit of extra constitution if you want it. Gnomes, two of them do have dexterity plus two, so we have the forest gnome here, which gives you speak with animals, which is a lovely spell, and we get dark vision. And gnome cunning, gnome, gnome cunning is amazing, giving you advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, the wisdom one is the one we're looking for mostly, and charisma saving throws. The deep gnome here is almost a rogue specialist in a way. Sadly, we don't get dexterity plus two, we've got plus one, so we can get our dex to 16 at character creation. We've got superior dark vision, Always going to be useful, as long as you're within range of your ranged weapon, you're going to be able to see anyone in the dark. And then we get this stone camouflage. It's not like the wood elf or the halfling where we have proficiency in stealth checks, we have advantage on stealth checks. And so you can give yourself proficiency in stealth through these skills tab here, and then we can have advantage on that. And if you want, now that I'm here for skills, we do get to pick two skills to give ourselves expertise in. So you can. Let's say we go for stealth, give myself expertise in stealth, which means when I go over here, we've got a plus seven with advantage at level one. Absolutely amazing. I would usually reserve this for sleight of hand though, which is what Astarian already has. Because sleight of hand is probably one of the more widely used skill checks because it's used for opening chests and doors and for disarming traps and for stealing things, all of which you 
can and will be doing. Well, you don't have to steal things, but with the traps and locked doors, you will be using it. Another good one to choose, I feel, skills is athletics. Now, I wouldn't have my strength at eight if I was going to do this. Move this down, maybe something like this. So now our athletics has a plus five. It's not the highest, but when we get to level five, that's going to go up by another two. And why is athletics good? Well, it helps you shove. And we can, for one particular subclass, get two bonus actions a turn. And also helps you resist being shoved. So I, I quite like having that on my rogue. So I've done that in a uh, live stream recently. As for other skills, you want to make sure you don't overlap any skills from your background because you don't get given extra skills if you have a proficiency from your race and your background. So make sure you pick a background that doesn't overlap with any skill proficiencies. And then we get to pick four more most ra most races most classes only get to pick two more but here we get four and then any two we have expertise in so your rogues even if they don't have a massive intelligence could for example if we pick the right background that's why you just have to be careful make sure you've got the proficiency you want where's it gone there it is if we want to pick sage we can then go to skills and give ourselves arcana and now it's at a plus five at level one which other classes can do that but they would need a, their intelligence would have to be 16. If you want to be good at arcana checks, but you don't want to invest everything into intelligence, the rogue is the way to go. And bards can do something similar. They get expertise as well, but that's for another video. Right, then we come to actual ability points. As I've alluded to earlier, I'd, I'd max out your decks as much as high as possible. 16, maybe even 17. Perhaps you want to use your ability score increase at level 4 to make it up to 18. But only some races can do that. Astarian is a good example of a rogue who has a dexterity at 17. So max out your decks, or if you're making a strength road rogue, max out your strength as best as possible. But you will still need dexterity for your armor class. You're using light armor, unless, of course, you're using one of the races that gives you proficiency in medium armor, in which case, it, you know, maybe you can have 14 in dexterity. But unless you have medium armor proficiency, you kind of need dexterity. Constitution is always good to have, help you stay alive. Then it's up to you, whatever you feel like playing. We've got quite a lot to play with here. I quite like having a strength of at least 10 or really 12, really, for my own personal tastes, just for quality of life, being able to jump further and carry more items. Wisdom is always good for defense purposes because some spells, some of the nasty spells, control spells, make you make your characters roll wisdom saving throws and you don't want to be failing those if you can help it. But perhaps, I know quite a lot of you like to have the Tav as, as your main character and so you like to pump up charisma, absolutely fine. And even if you're not a charisma based class, perhaps you want to have persuasion and then we now have persuasion at plus six at level one. Again, not bad. I don't think any other class can do that from level one. So yeah, dexterity probably as high as possible, a bit of constitution and then whatever your playstyle is or whatever your idea for your character is. Just want to point out, I haven't really been professing for strength rogues very much. By all means, you can do it. It can and does work. Just need to make sure you're doing the right thing that you're using probably your melee attack for your sneak attack. All right, I'll show you sneak attack next, what you can and can't do with it, and then on to the rest of the levels. Now, before going to level two, as I might usually do in these guides, I think it's very important that I show you how sneak attack works. Now, I'm actually going to start by showing you how it doesn't work. So I've currently got a hand axe in my hand, and I don't get the option for sneak attack, because one thing that isn't said during character creation is that we must be wielding a finesse weapon in the main hand. So I'm now going to go and change this to a dagger. And now we can see that I've got a dagger. I've got this option for sneak attack. But currently I can't actually use sneak attack on this imp. We can't just be standing behind them. If we get their vision cone, I'm just, just outside their vision cone. So I've got two choices of what to do. I can either have an ally stand next to the enemy. And I can now use sneak attack. I'm going to get laser out here and wait. Or we can... Make sure that we have advantage, and the easiest way to do this is to hide. Just like that. And now I can use Sneak Attack. Got an odd animation with the gnomes currently. Seen it in one of my streams as well. I'm hanging on for dear life, although it's already gone. And I want to point out, let's bring this open, that although we use a finesse weapon, you can use your strength if you don't want to have a high dexterity rogue. I wouldn't say that's a, an amazing idea because it means your ranged attacks won't be so good. And we can't use sneak attack when we throw weapons. So, I mean, you can build a strength rogue, stroke, if you will. And they can be good, very good at shoving, for example. But you're going to be limited in what weapons you can use to sneak attack. And sneak attack is your main source of damage as a rogue. Without it, you're just doing one attack per turn. And honestly, it's not that great. So I'm just going to go and show you a ranged sneak attack. And again, the easiest way to 
get this to work is to have advantage. Often the best way is to be hiding. These imps don't actually start combat as soon as they see you for some reason. So I'm sneaking and you click on the sneak attack range button and we can see because I've got advantage from hiding I can now attack either of them. Let's just go for this one. Alright, it's a critical hit. And currently there is a bug where if we get a sneak attack critical hit, we get maximum damage from the sneak attack itself. Not from the weapon attack, not from the damage dice from the weapon, but from the sneak attack damage, this 2d6, which is the same as the, I guess it's a bug, for cantrips from spells. When you get a critical hit with them, we do maximum damage, so you can get level 5 Gale doing 40 damage with a fireball that hits. So I'm going to be using a rogue that I've used in my streams and also a star room when I get to him. And at level 2, there's no choice to make, but what we do get, absolutely lovely. What makes a rogue a rogue? We get cunning action dash and cunning action disengage, meaning we can use our bonus action to dash or disengage. Now, in 5th edition, most characters can't hide if using a bonus action. That is very much a Baldur's Gate 3 thing. If we were following 5th edition rules, hide would be an action and then rogues would also get cunning action hide. At level 3, we finally get our subclass choice, and currently we have Arcane Trickster or Thief. I'll start with Thief because it's the quick one. Um, so what we get is an additional bonus action. Might not sound like much, but it's absolutely massive. Because when we have dual wielding, it means we can make an extra attack. And we'll get to hand crossbows, or you can dash, you can hide, attack, hide. There's so much you can do with two bonus actions. And I don't often see this come up, but we have second story work, which means if you do fall and take damage, you gain resistance to that falling damage. Most of the time, you know when you're going to take full damage. Not all the time, but most of the time you do. And you can cast Feather Fall from someone else, perhaps. But that's a thief, and it's, they're absolutely amazing. I personally, my own preference is Thief over Arcane Trickster. Some of you know that from my comments during streams. But anyway, let's come to Arcane Trickster. What do we get? Oh, we get some spell casting, which sounds good, and because it is good, right? But it's just Thief is such... That extra bonus action is such a strong thing. So what do we get? We get some level 1 spell slots unlocked, and we get Mage Hand Le Jardin. Uh, so we basically get this Mage Hand, which is invisible. In Baldur's Gate 3, this Mage Hand is basically the same as other Mage Hands, but in I do know in 5th edition that this particular Mage Hand for Arcane Tricksters actually have some other things they can do. Anyway, we get two cantrips from the Wizard spell list, using Intelligence as the spellcasting modifier. I just don't, don't take True Strike. Every time I say this, someone tries to come up with a reason why True Strike can be used. Oh, it means we can use Sneak Attack next turn. Just hide and attack. That's what your rogue is for. Right, uh, pick any two that you want. And like I said at character creation, though, I mean, yes, we can take Firebolt, but our Sneak Attack is going to do more damage. So I would usually say that, you know, Sneak Attack is probably going to be better rather than using Firebolt. But anyway, pick whatever you want. If you want to have an AoE cantrip, because rogues don't often get AoE damage, apart from maybe with arrows, use Acid Splash, and by the way, we can't use arrows with sneak attacks. It's a bit sad, like special arrows, such as fire arrows. Maybe you want some light, or you want to be able to cast friends, whatever, like I said earlier, same choice as the High Elves get. Then we get to pick two spells from the Illusion or Enchantment School, of which there are only five currently. I wouldn't pick Charm Person. You may as well use friends if you're going to use Charm Person. It's not really that useful in combat either, because it just means they won't attack your rogue, but they can attack everyone else. Color Spray is fine. But there is a ring of color spray, which you can use once per battle. Whereas this, you use up a whole spell slot, which you only get two of at the beginning. Not very good. Disguise self is good in certain situations. You can then dress yourself up as a rogue. A rogue. Dress yourself up as a drow or a githyanki or whatever. They get lots of dialogue options, you see. Tasha's Hideous Laughter is not a bad spell. It does require concentration. Now, I have seen some people say that with Tasha's Hideous Laughter, you get critical hits against them automatically. You don't. You get advantage against the attacker. Uh, the one thing I don't like about Tasha's Hideous Laughter is every time you hit them and do some damage, they get another saving throw. Also, they have another saving throw at the end of each turn. While it works, it's okay, but uh, you can expect the enemy to be resisting this before the end of 10 turns for sure. And sleep. Out of all of these, I much prefer sleep. Especially at these early levels where we are fighting enemies with low numbers of hit points, such as goblins. That attacks against sleeping creatures do automatically have a critical hit if you're standing within 5 feet. Uh, so I would usually suggest sleep. Since we've got a ring of colour spray, I'd usually avoid it and then either go for Disguised Self or Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Now, we're not concentrated, we haven't got any other concentration spells currently, so actually Tasha's isn't so bad. And then we get one more spell from the wizard spell list. Now you've got to remember that... Again, unless your intelligence is high, now this rogue's intelligence isn't high, but we'll 
we can sort that out later. Even if your intelligence isn't high, there are still some good spells, such as Featherfall is good for someone to have it. Find Familiar is okay. Your Familiars do last through a long rest, but if they die, you have to use another spell slot, which I don't particularly like when we have... Well, I understand it, but I think you can go through spell slots very quickly if you're not careful. Grease is fine. Jump would be good. Long Stride would be good. Magic Missile is nice for someone to have it so that you can finish off enemies with low numbers of hit points. Again, maybe Thunder Wave, but unless you've got a high intelligence, I'd probably be staying away from these, but can give you that AoE damage that rogues are generally lacking. One thing about Mage Armor is it gives you a base armor class of 13. Now, your dexterity is usually quite high, and the best light armor, or best in terms of having the highest armor class, sorry, is Studded Leather Armor Plus One, which is an armor class of, well, 13, the same as Mage Armor. So then you could give yourself some non light armor and cast Mage Armor instead, perhaps. And what would I probably go for? I think Jump is quite good for a rogue lets them get around more easily and since i've got a short race here no maybe just long strider so we can catch up with everyone else i wouldn't use expeditious retreat because you already have dash as a bonus action so you don't need to cast this it'd be a bit of a waste so if we accept this yeah we get two level one spell slots at level three which is a bit sad really as an arcane trickster at level four we get an extra level one spell slot and we get to pick a new spell from the illusion or enchantment schools maybe disguise self and then we can replace a spell. I don't think this is really supposed to happen according to 5th edition rules, but let's say I didn't like Tasha's hideous laughter. I can currently, in patch, as of patch 9, replace it with any wizard spell. So you can actually start to have more wizard spells than perhaps arcane tricksters should really know. Perhaps I want to have magic missile instead. When it comes to the ability score improvement or feat, I'm going to show you Astarian's level, level up screen as well. I think it's a bit more interesting. With a dexterity at 16, I would strongly suggest put your dexterity up by 2 because it helps your ranged attacks, attacks with finesse weapons, your armor class, your initiative, dexterity saving throws. It's, it's just really, really good. You can't go wrong with extra dexterity as a rogue. However, when we get to Astarian's level up screen, what we'll see is that his dexterity is 17. It's an odd number. Now, at level 1, no, having an odd number might feel a bit bad, but... Well, what could we do? We could put Dexterity plus one, or maybe Wisdom plus one, or Intelligence plus one, if he wants to fix another one of these odd ability scores. But we've got so many choices. Like perhaps you could pick... Uh, basically, there's a, there's a, there are a few feats that give you Dexterity plus one, so you can round off, or even up, whatever the proper term, term is, the Dexterity, and get some other benefit to it as well. I wouldn't usually pick Athlete. When you're prone, standing up uses less movement, a lot less movement, in fact, only five feet, which is nice, but it doesn't come up too often. Perhaps Defensive Duelist, because you will be normally wielding a finesse weapon, and it uses your reaction, and this increases your armor class by two for an attack can be okay. Dual Wielder is good because we get an extra plus one bonus to armor class and rogues without a feat do not have proficiency with shields anyway. And then we can also use two weapon fighting even if your weapons aren't light which kind of if you want the best damage restricts you to rapiers only but it's, it's good generally quite good especially as a thief because we get two offhand attacks per turn if we don't hide. We've got two bonus actions put it that way. We get the magic initiates which can be okay maybe more so if you're a, an arcane trickster so you can lean into that spell casting and since intelligence is used for the arcane trickster perhaps you could go for magic and shit wizards which kind of leans into that intelligence but pick any of these if you want that spell casting mobile is always going to be good Move, more movement speed especially when rogues can be ranged or melee you might want to be moving around the battlefield quite a lot to get to a specific target to use sneak attack on and also helps you evade opportunity attacks although you do have disengage as a bonus action so this isn't as needed but mobile is still very very good now i think the most interesting thing we can do with someone such as a starion is actually give them moderately armored because we can get dexterity up to 18 perfect and then we do get medium armor and shield proficiency at which point you can start wearing the thank half plate and a shield with no drawbacks to any of your attacking you have a very high armor class which can be up to 19 if we do that obviously you, you if you have a shield you are limiting yourself to a single weapon so you can't be dual wielding. That's a choice you've got to make. And one other one that is potential is Weapon Master. I don't normally say Weapon Master is good, but we get this rounded off dexterity and then we can pick some weapons to become proficient with. Uh, he's already, yeah, proficient with a hand crossbow. Heavy crossbow, if you want to go for a single uh, ranged weapon attack instead of the hand crossbows. And then he's also already got longsword. And rapier. Scimitars are finesse weapons, which rogues are not automatically proficient with, but those are the last two other ranged or finesse weapons, so then you've got to pick two other weapons that you are going to become proficient with, and unless you've got a high strength, most of them are going to be kind of useless, not really used, but if you wanted to have him wield either a scimitar and or heavy crossbow, 
perhaps we can do that. I, for a Starion in particular, I do often go for moderately armored because it rounds off the, the dexterity and lets me wear some awesome armor. Uh, also allows you to wear things like boots and helmets, which is quite important because there are some pretty good magic items that require medium armor proficiency. So I'm actually going to do this for a Starion. And finally, we come to the level five level up screen and all rogues, this isn't just for arcane tricksters, all rogues get uncanny dodge. So use your lightning quick reflexes to protect yourself when, a, when an attack hits you. You only take half the usual damage. So for the first attack, first attack per turn, you take half the damage. Whatever, it, whatever the damage source is, you take half the damage. It does use up your reaction, so you can only do it once per turn. As an arcane trickster, I also get to pick another replacement spell. So perhaps I want to get rid of Disguise Self and give myself Thunder Wave. And now I've almost become a wizard. Well, I've now got a lot of non-enchantment and illusion spells. Evocation, transmutation, and now another evocation spell here. Hey, uh, I don't know if that will be changed in the future, whether the replacement spell will just be for those from illusion or from the illusion or enchantment schools. I can't say, I can't predict the future that much. All right, next up we will look at some items to look forward to. Okay, it's time to look at items. Now I've got two rogues here, so I've got the items spread out between them. You will Perhaps only have one rogue. Perhaps you'll have a star in as well, like I've got here. Who knows? Now, since I gave a star in medium armor master, and I, as I said before, I think it's quite a good idea. We can get an armor class of 20. Now, part of this, I have gone down and gotten the real sparky sparks. Well, I don't often get items from Grimforge, but I think it's just worth pointing this out because this all links up with this, this particular item, the speedy light feet, which requires medium armor proficiency. So when the wearer dashes or takes a similar action during combat, they gain three lightning charges. Now as a thief, we get two bonus actions. So we can dash and hide and sneak attack. Or if you want to dash, dash and attack, perhaps sneak attack if you've got an ally within five feet of an enemy and we get this extra damage. What, do, what are lightning charges? Well, you have plus one to attack rolls. So it turns your weapon into a plus one weapon or like whatever your weapon is, plus one, and you get one lightning damage, which is like, eh, it's okay, it's not bad. But if you've got five charges, they're consumed the next time you deal damage and you deal an additional 1d8 lightning damage. So you're increasing your damage over the turns. Now linked to that, I've also given Astarian the Jolt Shooter. When the wielder deals damage using this weapon, they gain two lightning charges. So we've got two ways of building lightning charges here. We can dash, we get them from the boots, we can attack, we get it from the range attack, sorry, we get it from the longbow. And then there are other items that use lightning charges, but since we've got med uh, shield proficiency, we can then use this lightning aura. But since I am not dual wielding, I've got rapier plus one. I haven't gone and killed Nier. Nier does have a lovely rapier, which does an extra 1d4 psychic damage. Definitely worth getting if you want it. These fingers, fleet fingers, these fingers, these gloves, fleet fingers, once per turn after the wearer dashes, which I'm going to be doing because I want to be getting lightning charges, we can jump without using a bonus action. We get a free jump. Fleet Fingers comes from just outside the Blighted Village. There's like a hidden chest. Rapier plus one, we get just, we can buy it from a merchant. Jolt Shooter comes from Joaquin's Rest and saving Councillor Floric. I've also got here the Helmet of Grit. When the wearer has 50% 50, 50 hit points or less, they have an additional one, additional bonus action, plus dexterity saving throws plus one, which then if I go beneath 50% hit points, I'll get three bonus actions, which is absolutely crazy. Now, one of the downsides to using this setup is we kind of miss out on the other awesome setup star and walks off now this is now more geared towards the arcane trickster because i've picked up the warped headband of intellect change my intelligence intelligence to 17 so now my cantrips have got a much higher chance of hitting as do my other spells such as thunder wave here if i didn't do this perhaps i would actually give her the helmet of autonomy to give proficiency and wisdom saving throws as well as the advantage we get from being a gnome which is awesome. This is the studded leather armor plus one I was talking about earlier. Comes from the Zentarim down in the, their little hideout near Joaquin's Rest and armor class 13. So now even though her she's only got light armor, her armor class is 17, yeah, 17, which, which is pretty starting to get good. I have, I've had fighters and paladins with armor class of 17 before and survived perfectly well. Got the ring of color spray, which gives us this color spray spell once per battle. Awesome. So I don't have to use one of my valuable spell slots. I've just picked up a short sword plus one because it's about as good as we can get if we're dual wielding without taking the dual wielder feat. And the ritual dagger coming from inside the shattered sanctum in the goblin camp. Now why have I got this on my offhand? So I can attack with my offhand and give myself bless if I hit, which makes my short sword and therefore my sneak attack more likely to hit. I didn't show any necklaces actually. I don't find the necklace is so important for rogues. I mean, Amulet of Misty Step is obviously awesome. Helps you get around and if We've got two bonus actions. We can misty step and then hide if we need to to get 
the advantage or get an extra offhand attack. I mean, this extra bonus action is amazing. We can heal ourselves with it. Any item that uses a bonus action. And one other ring I think is really good for rogues. We're stacking up the smuggler's ring. The smuggler's ring can be found uh, next to the river near the knolls hidden on a skeleton. It gives stealth plus two, sleight of hand plus two, charisma minus one. Bear in mind, Star in here does have expertise in stealth and sleight of hand. Let's have a look at his skill bonus for these two. It's plus 12, which is absolutely ridiculous. And this is without having guidance or the spell enhance ability for advantage or any bardic inspiration. I mean, just, just a plus 12. Most locks have a DC of 10 or 15. And even at DC 15, which is supposed to be starting to get a bit difficult, you need to roll a three. And we've definitely passed. And with guidance, roll a two. For the majority of locks, and traps to disarm and stealing is plus 12. You're going to be able to do whatever you want. Yeah, going to get into some fights and show you off these couple of kind of builds, but just, you know, what can the rogue do? What should we be doing? One last item I didn't actually, don't actually have with me right now, but Minthara's armor, which would give Tavarina advantage to constitution saving throws. She doesn't really have any spells that are concentration apart from Mage Hand, I believe. So it's not like they're so important. The armor class is 12 though, so it's a tiny bit less. Total armor class would be 16 for Tavarina here. So how do rogues play in combat? Let's have a look. And I would say it's very much fitting for a rogue to see if, if we've got some enemies. All right, we know they're going to attack us. We're going to get a sneak attack in as early as possible. Don't see why we wouldn't. So now they're all surprised, which is lovely. So I've got one lightning charge. I will bring the others in in a second. So the point of this whole setup with these boots is we take... Gunning action dash. Our oh, lightning charges go up to four. Now we won't get the extra 1d8 damage this time around. Fair enough. We can jump because of the fleet of because of fleet fingers. If I want, I could if I want to now dash to get more lightning charges, but I couldn't get a sneak attack currently. So we've dashed. We can hide, get a sneak attack. Now it looks like South Breath is going to parry a lot of the damage. Oh no, look at that, 20 damage. We got seven on 1d8 plus four. Deck from Dexterity. 9 on 3d6, that's the sneak attack damage, and it all kind of adds up. But it was our only attack that turn. Now, one benefit of having hand crossbows. This won't really work out so well in this first round of combat, but something I didn't mention earlier is uh, our main hand attack does 1d6 plus 4 damage. Here we are, ranged attack. We use our action. Our offhand attack, for some reason, I, it's beyond me. Our offhand attack with hand crossbows also add our Dexterity modifier to the damage. Which is probably better to give it to the thief. Or even probably is better, really. But I'm going to use sneak attack again. Because this is how we get our main damage. Uh, hopefully we'll also see the uncanny dodge come into play. So generally, an arcane trickster will either sneak attack or use a spell. Currently, actually, if I use sleep on South Beretha, Raider Zastri will probably go wake her up. So maybe there's not much point in using that. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, I think I'm going to be using sneak attack. Because why, why wouldn't we? Here we are on a star run again. I'm going to dash. And this is the reason for having the shield. What's it actually called? The real Sparky Sparks Wall. I can consume four lightning charges and release a blast of energy. So we're going to be a bit brave. Time to move. We're going to run into the middle. This uses our action. Some of them are now jolted. And it says they can't take reactions. Let's test that out. Right, there we are can walk away from them. And I've still got a bonus action. Now you see, if I was wielding hand crossbows, I could take another shot. The hand crossbow, as it is, I'll use flourish. I can't use flourish because I'm out of movement. Right, that's my own fault. Except I can jump to here, can't I? Try and use flourish. Balance. Which is nice because then the next person has advantage on their attack. Yeah, I didn't show you earlier. That's a star and I gave him. I took off the helmet of grit and did give him helmet of autonomy to give him proficiency on wisdom saving throws which helps against things such as hold person right back to here this is one of the problems with the arcane trickster spells if you're looking for damage is that by the time right, we're fighting level five enemies here damage from the level one spells isn't that great we really want it for its utility neither can i use color spray quite yet right let's go and use an offhand attack oh not enough movement which means i can't use an offhand attack so i'm going to go back to the good old sneak attack 17 damage isn't to be sniffed at. All right, back to Astarian. And again, because I've got two bonus actions, I'm going to dash. I've got six lightning charges. So my next attack will do an extra 1d8 lightning damage. It looks like Red Astri is not looking good. Get it jolted. Sneak attack. Gone. 
That was pretty much exactly what I needed because of this extra 1d8 lightning damage. We don't get sneak attack on the opportunity attacks there. It's just a regular attack. So let's have a look at this damage against a Starin. Ah, right, a Starin had already used his reaction for the opportunity attack, which meant he couldn't use uncanny dodge. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't get to control whether we have uncanny dodge or attacks of opportunity. They're not in the reaction tab, in the reaction window. We can't we can't control it whatsoever. Let's just use an offhand attack just to try and show you. Yeah, we got two plus four. And then perhaps I could use, come a bit closer, and can we use color spirit? Oh, no, that's great. Yeah, it did work. Whew. Which then means the Starring doesn't need to hide. Double dash. And just sneak attack because we have advantage from another source. Oh, look at that critical hit. Right. As I mentioned earlier, critical hits with sneak attacks currently bugged. We always roll maximum damage on the sneak attack set portion of the damage. So we roll 36 and 66. We can and do also... It, I mean, the, the information's a bit wrong here, but we roll 13 lightning damage because when you get a critical hit, any damage die or damage dice rolled, you get to roll twice as many. So I rolled 2d8 instead of 1d8 on the lightning damage there from the lightning charges. But with the star in some class of two, oh, they're at six. I'll have a look at that in a second once it's our turn. So we can see here, the this Githyanki attacked Starion, hit him. Roll of 21, did 13 damage, but it gets halved. 13 minus 7. Well, basically you halve it and then you round up, which is why it's 13 minus 7 rather than 13 minus 6. So this ritual dagger gives, it says, blood sacrifice, gains plus 1d4 burnt, basically it's blessed for a turn. So now we're much more, much more, we're more likely to hit. I can't hide, but what I can do is put a star in next to him. So we can go for a sneak attack melee. 17 damage, not bad. Starring can try the same. Yes, Starring can try the same. And something, actually, I can show you now. I was think, wondering about this. We take a potion of speed. We can. This doesn't work like this in 5th edition. We can take two different sneak attacks in a turn if we have two actions. So I just used sneak attack melee, available next turn. I can now use sneak attack range. And in fact, because I'm a, a thief, I can hide again. After taking a potion. This is over the top, he's only got a hit point left. And there we are. So I found myself in this situation. I've got a Silence Aura. It's a Starion's turn as well. I've got the two rogues here. We're against these Dwergar. And I want to get rid of the Silence Bubble. So what I'm going to try and do... First of all, I need to walk outside of it so I can cast. But as an Arcane Trickster, I picked up Magic Missile. And perhaps one other item I didn't think about until just now. Anyone with magic missile picking up the psychic spark actually gives you a fourth missile even with a level one spell slot gives you a fourth missile to use and i've got an offhand attack also now which i can use to have a pot shot why not probably should have gone a bit closer and now for a star and i've switched this helmet back to the helmet of grit i've got exactly half hit points i've got three bonus actions so what i've got a couple of choices here i can try and take some shots at these reanimated corpses but I know that these are being controlled by a Dwergar up here. Get Cole, so maybe I want to get closer to him. Now, I don't want this low ground, so what can I do? I can dash, first of all, to get up to here. This might seem dangerous. I guess it is a bit. So what can I do here? I can do a couple of things. Perhaps I want to sneak attack now with my weapon. I could hide. And I'd suggest it's actually a very good idea. And then, I've got actually two choices again. If you're hiding and the enemy can't see you, you can walk away without taking any opportunity attacks. You can see there are no arrows appearing from beneath the character models here. But I want to actually sneak attack. I could try and shove. I've got another bonus action left, in fact. Sneak attack's probably going to do the most damage. I could potentially get rid of Logan altogether. But I want to see if I can get a critical hit or something. Sometimes I swear the game hears me when I'm making videos, when I say that sort of thing. Because of the bug with sneak attack damage, I just did 50 damage. There was a time earlier I did 53 damage with a star in because of the fact we always roll 36 on 66. That will change by the time the game comes out. I'm, I say I'm sure, I can't imagine it wouldn't change. As a rogue, I don't even have to hide before moving away. I could just disengage. Yeah, let's just disengage. I've already, I've, 
Previously, I cast Jump on a Starion, and because we've got three bonus actions, I could... Could have. Not that I'm going to. I could jump three times, and then dash, and because of Fleet Fingers, jump a fourth time with the jump spell. You could get so far across. You could probably go further, or at least as far as someone with the fly spell on dashing. All right, so we did... Oh, a Starion took just two damage there by the looks of it. Yep, he was hit for two damage. And it is possible to take zero damage if the enemy does one damage somehow, like with uh, acid or fire. If they roll a one, that gets halved down to zero, in fact. So again, I've got three bonus actions to be using. And because of the lightning charges, I've just, at least one of them is probably going to be a dash. Let's get out of the fire. And so now I can hide to sneak attack. And take another offhand attack because I've switched now to hand crossbows, which also deals an extra one lightning damage before trying to get away. Now, the only reason he can jump so far is because of the jump spell. It's not because the Starring can normally jump that far. And because we've dashed, we're now probably in complete safety. This is one of the benefits of having a high movement speed. It's be very difficult for Holvik to be able to catch up and to be able to see a Starring, even though he's not hiding. It's just completely out of line of sight going to dash outside of this bubble, but now I've done that. Unless I get someone else to stand next to an enemy, I can't use sneak attack. And this is why I prefer thieves, because you're pretty much guaranteed to be able to use sneak attack every single turn. Alright, so what am I going to do? He's on an annoying 25 hit points, which means sleep won't work, because the enemy had 24 hit points that put them to sleep. It's going to try a magic missile again, disrupt his concentration, hopefully, because it forces three separate checks. Might, yeah, might pass them all. But, you know, it's one of your best chances to disrupt concentration. Now, perhaps you could give your arcane tricks to the Helmet of Grit, but why, why wouldn't you want three bonus actions? That's my question, if you said that. And also, because of the way the game still works, let's just dash for the lightning charges. I don't have a huge number of scrolls, actually. But, I mean, since we've got scrolls, why, you know, I could just use this instead of becoming an arcane trickster. Focus concentration as well. And I've still got two bonus actions. One, and uh, he's gone. Try another one. And we're just dealing out so much more damage with this extra, these extra bonus actions compared to the Arcane Trickster. We're going to look at the Illithid power here and also taking on a single enemy, which is kind of what rogues are fairly good at since we get high single target damage. But one thing I haven't mentioned so far is we have bonus actions. And we're not in combat yet, so this doesn't matter too much. But don't forget, we can dip our weapons. And if we're dual wielding, you will get both weapons dipped in fire. I could sneak attack. Although apparently that may be a bit too far away. Oops, didn't mean to do that. There we are. What I'm going to do though is show you. That if you're dual wielding... Well, it doesn't have to be hand crossbows. It could be daggers, short swords, or whatever. If you do attack, if we've got this little button here, or press R. I usually use the shortcut key myself. If you see two tiny swords, it is a very small though, then you'll attack with both. And outside of combat, this means you'll actually attack twice. Whereas if I used sneak attack, it would only happen once. Or if I use just my offhand attack, it will only actually attack with one. Let's just attack with both. There we are. Attack, uh, clicked once, shot off twice. Oh, I probably should have dashed. And uh, I can still dash. You can dash while hiding and stay dashed. And now we use sneak attack because this is what we're made for. Look at that. That wasn't even a critical hit. 22. We are level 5 though here. With some fire damage, with one lightning damage. And Pom is half dead already. And I can get the arcane trickster here to do the same thing. May as well dip. And this time if I turn dual wielding off, if I attack, she only attacks once. Which is kind of a missed opportunity, I guess. I'm actually going to take these two away. We don't really need them. This isn't very fair, having four level five characters against Palmer. And a poor Palmer. So what is our tadpole power? Well, it's called Ink Blot. Now I found out, as soon as you click it, it works. This is one of the few abilities that for some reason we don't have to click twice. And I've seen some people mention, they, why do we have to click twice? It's because accidents happen. I very much like that we have to click things twice. This one just works. What it does is it creates a small cloud of darkness. And then we automatically hide as part of the bonus action. Which means I can now try and walk away. It does block Palmer's vision, which is kind of useful here. We can see that this vision cone is completely empty in the middle. So I can try and come around to somewhere behind, perhaps. Do whatever you want. And 
dash to get the lightning charges and then probably yeah finish her off so yeah rogues are pretty good at focusing on single targets we will see that if you've got lots of bonus actions and you've got offhand attacks you can attack many different targets but there's kind of no inbuilt well no that's the wrong thing to say isn't it because arcane tricksters can get thunder wave or well, sleep isn't exactly airway damage but we can have thunder wave burning hands acid splash but if we do that we're missing out on our sneak attack damage i just want to point out how ridiculous this sleight of hand proficiency bonus is here we've got guidance already can give inspiration if you've got a bard Cat's Grace to give advantage, although we can't do both. Let's go with Cat's Grace. And that one would actually be the only way we can fail these sorts of checks. I mean, such high bonuses, it's going to be so easy to get through any lock whatsoever. And I also want to point out, when we use this ink block, it does actually have a large enough area that if there's people very much next to you, and he can hide and he shouldn't be targeted. In fact, what I'm going to try and do... No, she's used a bonus action. I don't really want to attack. I'm going to see if I can actually get this done. And have everybody hide inside, basically. That's going to be quite... Oh no, don't jump because that uses a bonus action. I'm going to have to dash. Let's see if we can completely hide from this spectator. So let's wait yeah we can hide inside so we can get you out of danger it's not just about trying to get sneak attacks off it can help you <laughs> death beckons it can help you if you're in a bit of trouble which Taverina was kind of in a bit of trouble and now we can come out of this cloud Ooh, and miss our attacks whoops anyways yeah i don't need to show you the rest of this fight but the point is you can get other people in your ink blot I don't know about you guys, but I actually kind of hate this fight here with all of these magma methods because so many of them have got heat metal coming out. They explode and everything. So I started the fight with the paladin. We're going to see what we can do with our two rogues. Now they're going to join the... The rogues will join the fight as soon as we do one attack. So we're going to start off with a sneak attack just to see if we can actually destroy one of them. We can see here our paladin taking plenty of damage. I did give him a potion of fire resistance, by the way. It's not such a bad idea. With the other rogue, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to start off with that. And then we get a whole bunch more. Now, generally, as I said earlier, rogues aren't necessarily the best at area of effect damage. So we're going to have to deal with that. I might actually use the paladin in this fight because there's so many of these things. So this time... I have given the Arcane Tricks to the Helmet of Grip, but I don't have below 50% hit points yet. I need to try and kill this one. It's concentrating on Heat Metal, which gives Starion disadvantage. And offhand attack. We're all wielding hand crossbows now, the rogues. Ooh, it's a shame, we've got one hit point left. So we can sneak attack against this one here. And then offhand attack. So although we don't have great area of effect damage, we can focus on several different targets in a turn because we've got all these offhand attacks. And there, one here. We're not going to kill it unless it was a critical hit because we're only going to do maximum of 10 damage. But yeah, this is now a bit more manageable. Let's just skip his turn. They're probably going to yeah, close the distance. What I could do, although it's very dangerous because I'm not an evocation wizard... I do have Thunder Wave, which could target the two imps. I do have Acid Splash. We can try and get two imps. And that's about the best we're going to get for AoE damage is from our spells on the Arcane Trickster. Thieves would have to use a scroll. Have something similar. There we are. So yeah, Hand Crossbows, very, very effective. Because This is going to be the last fight that I show you guys. So I found the Bula. I didn't kill it earlier. And we've got a single target with a lot of hit points. Had a bad start. The paladin fell to the deadly leap. Uh, nearly, nearly down. Anyway, what can we do? We're going to be doing the same thing. Rogues can be, especially the thief, a tiny bit repetitive. But they're very effective at what they do. I'm going to dash. I've got the lightning charge boots. Again, you might not have this. You might not want medium armor proficiency. That's absolutely fine. But I do have it. So I'm going to use it. Now, the chance to hit is 60%. That's not really good enough for my liking. We want to be stacking up as much damage as possible. We want high chances to hit. On 18 there. Now she already used Mage Hand, which is why it's here. 
She's gonna have the same thing here, really. Sneak attack. Ooh, that's unlucky, that's unlucky. Now after that jump, the two rogues are actually fairly well off compared to the bard. Because we had here, Bulette blasted the star in for, well, seven. It was, would have been 14. And it would have been 19, but got cut down to 10. So it took half damage there. Whereas the bard took a full 32 damage, but Astarion got 16. And the uh, other rogue, Tavarino, only took 8 damage. This uncanny dodge is actually a very strong ability. Really helps out with their survival. So we're going to get maximum lightning charges. Get up to 5. And what we can do, 65% chance isn't... For me, that isn't very good. If I had a higher chance to hit, so using an elixir of hill giant strength would work. Although I do have a bardic roll here, so... What I'm going to do, just to show you, we've got a bonus action. Don't forget to use poison if, in case you can't dip. Weapon and fire. Poison is also good. There we are. Got lots of damage stacking up there. Like I said, single target damage is what rogues do particularly well. Now, as an arcane trickster, these spells that I've picked don't really... Oh, Thunder Wave could maybe knock it off. It's very likely to pass any constitution saving throws since the constitution of this particular... Monster is 21, they get a plus 5. Maybe knock it away. I don't think that's going to work out so well, plus the damage here is just 2d8, whereas our sneak attack is 3d6 plus whatever, well, another, obviously 4d6 plus 5 there. So let's get closer. Oh no, oh yeah, sneak attack. Oh, another miss from her. <laughs> Oops, that was a mistake. Oh, down she goes. I probably will need the help of the paladin here. They failed. Ooh, nice. So in case you didn't know, this came up in my previous stream. Although I didn't get to see it. Chest Trauma is an amazing ability. Target has disadvantage of constitution saving throws. Okay, kind of helpful. And there's one fewer action. Cool, cool, cool. Right. Removed by healing. So now, Underwave is much more likely to work. Although, we're not going to knock them back very far. So it might not be that useful. Anyway, we're here as a rogue. We're going to keep on trying this. There we are, 20. And then a star in. Because we're a thief, we get this extra lightning damage. And I'm going to go for advantage this time. Oh, look at that. Perfect. And that's because rogues do single target damage very well. Just like paladins with their smites can do it. All right, so maybe I should actually get the bard back up, eh? Looks like you need a hand. There we are. You need a hand. Funny. Pat on my head. Up you get. <laughs> So let me know what items you give rogues. One I didn't mention, but I do have is Crusher's Ring here, an extra 10 feet of movement speed. Let me know if you use rogues in a particular way, whether you use a strength rogue, if you like rogues or not, and what things did I miss? I'm likely to have missed something out, right? So thank you very much for watching. If you want to give me some ideas or discuss ideas, please do just join my Discord. And thank you once again. I said it a few videos ago. Thank you to the members of my channel. You really do help support the channel. If you want to become a member, do cl click on the link below. Thank you very much for watching. And hopefully I'll catch you in the next one. With some of this lovely lock picking opening action. Bunch of empty boxes.